Lacking the infamy of the Black Dahlia or Jack the Ripper, the murder of Julia Wallace often flies under the radar. Set in Liverpool to the backdrop of a bitterly cold winter, it is a visceral murder case with very few thought right answers. Contemporarily described as one of the most diabolically ingenious murder mysteries of modern times, tonight we turn our eye on the life of William Herbert Wallace and the sudden unresolved murder of his wife Julia. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. During the latter half of the 18th and throughout most of the 19th centuries, Liverpool was in a constant tug of war with several cities, including the likes of Glasgow, Birmingham and Manchester, to be crowned the second city of the British Empire, generating huge wealth and pushing social and economic boundaries. Throughout the Victorian era, it maintained a staggering level of activity, with over 40% of the world's trade passing through the dockyards. It was home to the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the first railroad system to discard the use of animals in favour of steam power exclusively, as well as a host of other innovations, such as signalling and fully scheduled timetables. The offices of the White Star Line sat by the docks, famous for its ownership of the Titanic, which, whilst built in Ireland, was registered at one of the many docks on the River Mersey that thrive with ships. Through Irish immigration and border expansion, in less than a hundred years the city more than trebled in size. Despite these heights, Liverpool quickly began floundering as the 20th century broke. The Atlantic slave trade, which had funded much of the city's earlier successes, was firmly abolished a hundred years prior, and exports of goods had stagnated and eventually started to shrink. By 1931, the population of Liverpool sat at a number around 850,000 strong. The bars were filled with the jazz of Duke Ellington, the cinemas lit up with scratchy black and white of Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff. The streets were lined with new housing, emerging from the rehousing projects that had sprung up to negate the rising unemployment as the grip of the Great Depression reached out across oceans, uprooting entire industries and wrecking trade markets overnight. The winter of 1931 was a cold and bitter one. Snow and ice had laid on the ground for much of it, and storms blew through regularly. For most, life was permeated by the simple pleasures of radio plays and walks in the local parks. And so it was for William Herbert Wallace and his wife Julia, residents of Wolverton Street, Liverpool, who, until this point, none had heard of. Within a year this would all change, as William Herbert Wallace was about to become a household name throughout Liverpool and the nation. William Herbert Wallace was born in Milham, Cumberland, in the northwest of England on the 29th of August 1878. He was the first of three children to his parents, Marjorie Hall and Benjamin Wallace, a printer and stationer by trade and part-time insurance agent for the Prudential. At a young age he showed enthusiasm for the outdoors, sports and the arts, and was known to enjoy nature, cricket, football and Greek and Roman philosophy. His father was an amateur geologist and mother a pianist, both having a solid influence on William as he grew older when he developed a keen interest in chemistry and learned to play the violin. As a youth, he helped his father in the print workshop and in 1892 at the age of 14 he left school to start work as a draper's assistant, studying a five-year apprenticeship under Master Draper Thomas H. Tennant in Barrow. Upon completion of his apprenticeship, he worked in several positions relating to drapery but fancied himself more worldly. Wanderlust, which had obsessed me in earlier years, grew to fever heat, and at the age of 23, I sailed for India. William arrived in India in 1902, and he took up a salesman's position in the Calcutta branch of Whiteway Ladlaw & Co. However, he'd suffered from kidney trouble, and after just a few years, in 1905, he moved to Shanghai, where his brother worked as a printer for the British government with his wife. This move was again short-lived, and after several hospital stays due to recurrent problems with his kidneys, he returned to England by doctor's advice on 19th of March 1907. Within a month of his return, he was admitted to hospital for surgery to remove his left kidney. It took him 18 months to recover and return to work at a Manchester branch of Whiteway Ladlaw & Co. However, he found the work tiresome and droll, and so instead, he left the company to pursue his interest in politics. He lived with his family in Harrogate and began speaking for the local Liberal Party. In 1910 he took the position of Liberal Registration Agent in the Ripon Division of Yorkshire. 
It was at this time that he met Julia Dennis, who captivated him immediately. In his diary, he wrote of his feelings for her. Dark-haired, dark-eyed, full of energy and vivaciousness. She filled in every corner of the picture I had dreamed of, that one woman of all the world most men enshrined in their hearts. She lived just two streets down from William, and the pair began spending a great deal of their free time together. Julia Dennis has a somewhat more mysterious early life, and certain dates and details were obfuscated, moving many of the facts into a grey area. What is known is that she was born on the 28th of April, 1861, in Bromcliffe Farm, North Yorkshire. She was the second of seven children born to her parents, William Dennis and Anne Smith. On the eve of her 10th birthday, Julia's mother Anne died giving birth to her seventh child, which hit her father very hard. His health suffered, and eventually this forced him to give up farming, instead taking on a role as innkeeper. It was a briefly held position though, and in 1785 he too passed away, succumbing to liver disease. Julia embarked on a career of teaching and became a governess to several families, an occupation which could offer her stability and a roof above her head. It's during this time when facts surrounding Julia turn a little south. At the age of 40, she cut 10 years from her age on the official census, giving herself as 30, a fabrication that was possibly invented to aid in her employment, as she apparently took this new age into her relationship with William Herbert Wallace. After the pair met, they began dating and quickly married in 1914. On their marriage certificate, she gave herself the age of 37, 16 years younger than her actual age of 53. And she also fabricated her parents' occupations, promoting her father as a veterinary surgeon, and her mother's name gained an accent Igu and a French origin. Her birthplace had also shifted to Leafy and well-off Sussex. It's been theorised that these fabrications were made by Julia originally to aid in her securing employment as a governess, being that most women in the role were young, single and from middle class well-bred backgrounds, which her own true background fell quite a way short. How much of the deception was known by William Herbert Wallace, now her husband, is unknown. None of her siblings attended the wedding, and he married Julia knowing her name is the only truth. Regardless, the pair were now happily married, and William and his father moved in with Julia, living in her flat in Harrogate. At the outbreak of war in 1914, all party politics was suspended, and William's position in the Liberal Party was lost. Instead, he answered the call to fight for king and country, like most men of the time. He answered the call six times, in fact, each time unsuccessful, as his medical issues surrounding his earlier kidney surgery stopped him from enlisting. Instead, with the aid of his father, he took a position as an insurance salesman with the Prudential, earning £270 a year, plus 30% commission. It was a good wage at the time. The new job was based in Liverpool, and so William and Julia up sticks and rehomed themselves in central Liverpool in March of 1915, living in the district of Clubmore, nearby to William's agency. One year later, in 1915, they moved to a three-bedroom terraced house in Wolverton Street, Anfield, built only three years prior, and settled down to a comfortable life. It was an unremarkable lower middle class area of Liverpool. The houses were not at all showy, but they were a step up from some of the more destitute housing in the lower class areas. They lived reasonably well, able to afford a cleaning lady who visited once per week, and by all accounts appear to have had a happy marriage. William described these earlier days of their marriage as Filled with complete enjoyment, with all the happiness of quietude and mutual interest and affection. They slept in the master bedroom, whilst William turned one of the spare rooms into a chemistry lab and Julia the other into a storeroom for her various accessories, hats and clothing items. William studied chemistry at the Liverpool Technical College and two years later he began working there as a part-time lecturer in chemistry, a position which he held for five years. William and Julia's evenings were filled with listening to radio plays together. William, who had recently taken up playing the violin, accompanied Julia while she played piano, and the couple often took walks together in the local parks. William also founded the Central Chess Club with his friend James Caird, and twice a week the club met in Cottle City Caff, in the basement of 24 North John Street, a venue which played higher to many activities. 
Whilst not the greatest player in the club, William played only on the second string team and attended the club semi-regularly, attending on most Mondays. However, he tended to skip the latter Thursday meetup unless he was scheduled for a tournament match. Towards the end of the 1920s, William's health once again caught up with him and he suffered frequent bouts of kidney ailments, headaches and depression, often leaving him bedbound. Further to this, Julia too seemed to suffer from equal bouts of poor health, often gastric or bronchial in nature, and the pair seemingly lived for several years, alternating periods of health and sickness. During a spat of bronchitis, William found himself bedridden, and as such, he handed over his insurance rounds to colleague Richard Parry, who covered for him and visited William at home to hand over cash collections and brief William on the work undertaken. And so life continued for the Wallaces, alternating bouts of illnesses, but otherwise living a quiet life. When asked about the couple, opinions were mixed. One nurse, Mrs Florence Wilson, who had looked after William in the early 20s, remarked on them as a very peculiar couple. Their attitude towards one another appeared to be strained and the feeling of sympathy and confidence which one usually found existing between man and wife appeared to be entirely absent. She described Wallace himself as a man who appeared to have suffered a keen disappointment in life. And she described Julia as peculiar in her manner and dirty. During her husband's illness, she slept on the sofa in the kitchen, although the front bedroom was vacant. Relations between them were not those of a normal couple, and they were certainly not the happy and devoted couple as described by other people. Most of this was an observation and opinion shared by the family doctor, who also remarked on his thoughts that the couple appeared to perhaps not be as happy as they liked to appear to others. William Herbert Wallace himself makes little mention of fighting or malice in his diary entries. In fact, quite the opposite. He wrote instead of his concern for Julia when she returned home late one night, leaving him with a great anxiety that she may have befallen a road accident. This even led him to check into the local police station to see if any reports of accidents had come in that evening. When she returned safely, delayed due to an accident on the tracks of the train she was riding, he wrote, It was a relief to know she was safe and sound. And there are many other entries pertaining to their marriage. On May the 15th, 1929, he wrote, Julia reminds me today, it was 15 years ago yesterday since we were married. Well, I don't think either of us regrets the step. We seem to have pulled well together, and I think we both get as much pleasure and contentment out of life as most people. Whilst it seems he forgot their wedding anniversary, his sentiment seems fairly clear. Whether or not they lived in perfect happiness and harmony, the couple's relationship overwhelmingly seems to have been one of placid companionship, filled with music and light radio entertainment, continually disrupted by illness, but, for the most part, quietly content. That was until January of 1931, when the story of William and Julia Wallace takes a nosedive into the world of murder, suspicion and mystery. Monday the 19th of January 1931 was another damp, windy day, following a week of storms that had been hanging over Liverpool. William left for work around 10am, catching the tram to his locale. By 2.30pm he was back home, having a schedule which allowed him every other Monday afternoon off. He had a chess meet-up that night, and after eating together with Julia, he set out between 7.15 and 7.20pm, leaving via the back door, and walked to the tram station to catch the number 14 tram that would take him there. At 7.20pm, Louisa Alfreds, a switchboard operator at the Anfield Telephone Exchange, connected to a phone box, receiving a call from a man asking to be connected to Cottle City Caff, the home of the chess club. After failing at the first try to connect the two, the same man called back two minutes later. This time he spoke with another operator, Lillian Martha Kelly. After conferring with her supervisor, Annie Roberts, concerning the initial connection difficulties, the call went through successfully and Annie logged the interaction on account of the small phone book earlier troubles. This log included the time, the phone box number, Anfield 1627, and the receiving number, Bank 3581. Gladys Harley, waitress at the cafe, picked up the phone receiver in the venue's small phone booth. A man's voice inquired after William Herbert Wallace, asking if he was at the cafe. Gladys handed the call over to the chess club captain, Samuel Beatty, who explained to the caller that though he had not seen Wallace yet that evening, and he couldn't say for sure if he would show up or not, 
He assured the caller that if he did, he would be due to arrive shortly and it may be better to call back later. The caller pressed that he was unable to call again and instead asked for Wallace's address, though Beatty himself did not know it. Instead, the caller suggested that he could leave a message with Beatty to pass on. He told Beatty that his daughter had just turned 21 and that he would like to speak to Wallace concerning his business of insurance, insisting that it was Wallace specifically he wanted to. He then left his name, R. M. Quattro, an address of 25 Menlove Gardens East, Mossley Hill, and asked that Wallace visit him at home the following evening at 7.30 pm. Beatty wrote this information down to pass on to Wallace, and the caller hung up after confirming that he had taken the correct information. At 7.45 pm, Wallace entered the cafe greeted by his friend James Caird, and sat down to play chess with another member. Caird didn't have a match that evening and he walked casually through the cafe. He was taken aside by Beatty, who asked Caird for Wallace's address, and he confirmed to Beatty, asking him why he didn't just ask Wallace himself who had by now arrived. Beatty then approached William's table and passed on the message he had received from the earlier call. Wallace wrote the details of the message into his prudential notebook, initially taking down the address as Men Love Gardens West until Beatty corrected him, where he struck out the West and corrected the note in block. Wallace left capital letters to East. He was initially confused by the message. He had never heard of an RM Quattro, nor of a Men Love Gardens East, and after some brief discussion with other members, who too could offer no assistance on the address or the name, he popped his notebook into his side pocket and returned to his game, which he proceeded to then win. At 10pm, William Wallace left the chess club with James Caird and fellow member Mr Betton. The trio caught a tram together and headed home. Caird lived in Letchworth Street, just a few streets down from Wolverton Street, so Wallace and Caird walked along, discussing the message. Coultrey was a fairly unusual name and neither men had heard of it before. The two made their farewells at Caird's doorstep and after a couple of minutes further walking, Wallace too reached home. Julie was still awake and the couple ate a late supper together and retired to bed. The morning of Tuesday January the 20th was a continuation of the week-long poor weather. F once again cold and wet. William Wallace donned his bowler hat and mac and ventured out into the rain to do his rounds at 10.30am returning at 2pm for lunch with Julia. By now the weather was much improved and after eating he left once again at around 3.15pm to finish up his day's work. At 5.15pm William made his last call of the day at 19 Eastman Road before returning home at 6.05pm for a light supper together with Julia. He had been turning over the previous night's message from Quattro all day and the time had come to make a decision. Deciding it best that he at least check out the mysterious address, it was after all a decent work opportunity. He left home at 6.45pm to track down the elusive Men Love Gardens East. Wallace hopped on the number 26 tram that took him to Tunnel Road at 7.06pm and he crossed onto the number 5 tram, chatted with the conductor Thomas Charles Phillips along the journey and confirmed for Edward Angus, the ticket inspector, that he was on the right route. He eventually jumped off at Penny Lane to catch a second connection, boarding the number 5A tram at 7.15pm. The 5A took him to his final jumping off point on the corner of Menlove Avenue and Menlove Gardens West at 7.20pm. Wallace walked down through Menlove Gardens West and he turned into Menlove Gardens North. The maze of roads was frustrating and he stopped a passerby. The woman wasn't overly sure where East was and suggested it could be a continuation of Menlove Gardens West. So, Wallace doubled back on himself and continued down Menlove Gardens West until it turned into Dudlow Lane. Here he met another passerby, Sydney Green, and asked directions again. Green explained to Wallace that there isn't an East as far as he was aware, only a North, South and West. Beginning to feel like he might be on a wild goose chase, Wallace instead decided to try 25 Menlove Gardens West and he knocked on the door apprehensively. 25 West was the home of Mr Richard Mather and his wife Katie Ellen Mather who answered the door and confirmed with Wallace that she'd never heard of an RM Quattro and he certainly wasn't living at the residence. Wallace thanked her for her time and he stepped back out onto the pavement. He thought he'd try Menlove Avenue and Menlove Gardens South but found that all the numbers of the houses were evenly numbered. Here he met another passerby who couldn't help. They were also a stranger to the area, 
As he pondered what to do next, a thought occurred now to Wallace. He somewhat recognised this area. His superintendent at the Prudential lived nearby, and maybe he could help. He stopped by his house, knocking on the door, but unfortunately the home was empty for the evening and no answer came. Now at a complete loss, he wandered once again around the local streets until he eventually met PC James Edward Sargent. The policeman confirmed Sidney Green's earlier thoughts that there was, in fact, no men love gardens east. Instead, he suggested to Wallace to try the local post office for a directory where he could at least check for the name Quadro. By now, it had been almost half an hour of searching before Wallace had walked into the Alberton Road post office at 7.45pm. His poor luck continued, and there was no directory. The manager of the post office pointed out the news agents across the street to Wallace and suggested he might try there instead. And finally, after speaking to the manager and Mrs Lily Pinches, he was loaned the use of a local directory. Though Lily Pinches confirmed as she passed the book over that there was certainly no Men Love Gardens East. By ten past eight, Wallace conceded the loss and decided to return home, frustrated. He repeated the tram connections home and arrived in Wolverton Street at 8.45pm. Tired and cold, William Wallace slid his door key into the front door of his house only to find the door would not budge and there was no reply to his rapping. With a sigh, he removed the key and tried the back door instead. There was a dim light shining from the scullery into the gloom of the kitchen, but little sign of any life. Again, after trying the door, he found that it too would not budge and he knocked hard on the wood. There was no reply. Skipping from the back to the front and then after confirming the door would not open, back to the rear entrance again, he met his neighbours, John Sharp Johnston and his wife Florence Johnston who joined him and suggested retrieving their spare key if he continued to have no luck. William mentioned that it was somewhat concerning as Julia would not have gone out as she was currently suffering from a bad cold and he asked if they heard anything unusual that night. The neighbours explained that they had not heard anything at all out of the ordinary just as the door finally came. William entered the dimly lit house, lighting a lamp with a match. Moments later, he burst back through the same door, exclaiming to the Johnstons, Come and see, she's been killed. The Johnstons slowly followed Wallace through the house from the kitchen, following his lamplight into the lounge, and there, fully clothed and lying on the floor covered in a blood-stained mac, was the body of Julia Wallace. 